particle physics, we have to deal with very tiny particles moving with lots of energy, very high velocity, very close to the speed of light. So what that means is we need to use both special relativity and quantum mechanics. Now in a later video we'll discuss how special relativity and quantum mechanics were combined by people like Dirac to give us the fundamental equations that describe high energy particles. But in this video we're just going to concentrate on special relativity and in particular we're going to look at relativistic kinematics. Now, I'm assuming that you're already familiar with the basics of special relativity. You know that it's based on inertial frames and that time and space are relative to the observer, so that we have transforms which affect both space and time coordinates when we move from one inertial frame to another. And those are called, of course, Lorentz transforms. Now what we're going to introduce here is a way of writing down space-time coordinates in a convenient short form a mathematical expression called a four vector. Essentially it's a four dimensional vector and we can then express a transform between two frames as multiplication by a four by four matrix. So let's see how we can do that and how we can create our four vector and how we can actually use that to construct quantities that are invariant. In other words, the same in all inertial frames. So here we have the standard setup for special relativity that you're uh, familiar with. So we have some inertial frame um, S here and we have a second inertial frame S prime that's moving with a velocity V relative to S in the positive x direction. So if we have some event that occurs at coordinates x, y and z here in frame s and it occurs at a time um, equal to t, then the rules for transforming these coordinates, the time coordinate and the x, y and z coordinate into the frame s prime here are that c times t prime is equal to gamma times ct minus beta x, where beta has our usual definition of the velocity, the relative velocity between the frames divided by the speed of light, and gamma here has uh, is defined as 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, to make things simpler, we're going to define something that we call a four vector. And so we can write this either as an X with a sort of squiggly line or tilde underneath it, or more commonly, um, we can write it as X mu, um, where this index here indicates that there's going to be four components. Sometimes this tilde notation can be useful if we're dealing with events that have a particle called a muon, whose symbol is mu, um, and you know that can avoid confusion fusion if we use the tilde notation at times. So either of these notations indicate a four vector, and we're going to define this four vector as, well, it's c times t, and we'll write a semicolon there, and then x, y, and z. So this is a four component vector which contains both the time coordinate and the x, y, and z coordinates. Now if we look at this mapping here between our x prime, right, so this will be the um, four vector in the frame s, and our uh, coordinates in the frame um, s, we can see that we could write this as this four vector here multiplied by a four by four matrix. And so we can now represent a Lorentz transform as a four by four matrix. So let's see how we do that. So here we have the same uh, Lorentz transforms that we had before, um, where we're transforming the coordinates into the frame S prime from S. And here is a 4x4 four four matrix that's going to do the job for us. And so we write this as capital lambda, and then the two indices of the matrix are mu and nu, and we write one at the top and one at the bottom for reasons that will become clear shortly. 
Now, if I take this uh, um, matrix and I multiply it by our four vector for in, in the frame S, then I'm going to have these four coordinates here. And so you can see that if I look at the first coordinate of the four vector I'm going to get by multiplying these two together, it's going to be gamma times CT minus beta gamma times x, which is, of course, exactly what we've got here for the first line of our uh, first uh, coordinate transform. Similarly, if I look at the second line, then you're going to get uh, minus beta gamma times ct plus gamma times x. And again, that gives us the coordinate uh, x prime, just as we'd expect. And then, of course, for y and z, we just get the equal to y and z. So this matrix, when we multiply it by the four vector, will transform the four vector from one frame into another frame. And we write that down using this notation here, where again, we are using the uh, repeated indices to imply summation over those indices, right? This is the Einstein summation convention. And so this is actually equal to the sum um, of nu from 0 to 3 of, you know, lambda nu nu times x nu, right? So again, repeated indices. So we're summing over these indices. That's just how we can write down matrix multiplication using summation convention. Now, we did that transformation assuming that we had a relative motion in the positive x direction. So if we had the frame S here, we ended up with um, S prime, we said, was moving in the positive x direction with a velocity v. Now, you might be wondering, well, what happens if we have any general velocity direction? Well, usually um, we don't need to do that because we can always rotate the axes so that the relative velocity is in the positive x direction. However, in the rare cases where you do actually need the general transform, you end up with a horrendous matrix, uh, which is shown here. And so this is where the velocity between the frames, uh, we can write this as essentially beta x, uh, beta y, and beta z, um, which, you know, if you expand this out, it's the obvious things you'd expect, vx over c, and then um, vy over c, and then vz over c. So this is the horrible expression you get in the general case. We will basically never use this because we will always we can always just assume that we're doing a transformation in one direction and we'll always take that direction to be in the positive x direction to use our nice simple matrix. But you can do it in any general direction if you really have to. So now we've introduced the concept of a four vector and we've shown how we can transform that four vector from one frame to another. The next thing we want to look at is the magnitude of a four vector. Now, naively, you might sort of write something down like this for the magnitude. You'd take x mu, multiply it by x mu, and so if we're using four position, we'd end up with essentially ct squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, and that's, of course, just sort of essentially a four-dimensional dot product um, that you do with a typical three-dimensional or even two-dimensional vectors. However, there is a problem with relativity in that this quantity here is not helpful because it varies, it changes between different inertial frames. Uh, you can check this out yourself doing the Lorentz transforms, but if you transform x to x prime, you'll find that this is not equal to x prime mu uh, times x prime mu. And so what we want is we want a magnitude that is invariant. It's the same value in all inertial frames. Just like when we look at an ordinary three-dimensional vector and you're doing you know, Newtonian or Galilean uh, relativity, so classical relativity, um, the magnitude of a vector in one frame has the same magnitude in uh, of a position vector in one frame has the same magnitude in all the other frames. So we need to change this. And it turns out that 
the way we do this is so a dot product in relativity between two four vectors we write it as x mu and times x mu and you'll notice here that I've put this mu down um, at the bottom instead of up at the top and this is equal to c squared t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared and this is the same in all inertial frames so if I did a Lorentz transform this would be equal to x prime uh, dotted with x prime so this has the same value in all inertial frames and it's something called a Lorentz invariant in other words it doesn't vary from one frame to the next as long as you're of course dealing with special relativity um, and just doing simple Lorentz transforms so what's the difference between this x mu here and this x mu at the bottom and how does that introduce these negative signs for the space-like components well to do that we need to introduce another 4x4 four four, uh, matrix and that 4x4 four four matrix is what we call the metric and it basically codifies the structure of space-time now in special relativity fortunately it's a nice simple matrix um, and because space-time is flat if you go into general relativity it becomes enormously more complicated but we don't know how to do general relativity in particle physics so we're sticking with special relativity so let's see how we get these two forms of our four vector so here we have how our two ways of writing the four vector are related and we also have here our metric that's g mu nu now for special relativity we always have exactly the same metric because we're working in flat space time now so the metric here looks a little bit like the identity matrix we've got ones along the diagonals and zeros in all the off diagonal terms but three of the um, diagonal values are minus one and this is where we get the minus uh, terms for the space-like component and of course the positive term for the time uh, component so this is our metric so why did I write those two vectors slightly differently well the this is really it's just a bookkeeping uh, notation to know when we've multiplied something by the um, uh, space-time metric so what we do is we say that if you've got written write the index for the four vector at the bottom this is called a covariant four vector and if you have the matrix if you have the index sorry at the top then this is a contra variant four vector and this is there's nothing fundamental about this is really just sort of a, a bookkeeping notation so that we know when we have multiplied something by the metric because these two are related to each other by multiplication through the metric so if I have the contravariant four vector um, all I do is multiply it by g mu nu and I have the covariant and in fact the reverse works as well only then of course you would write it as g mu nu times x mu and that would be equal to x um, uh, and that would be equal to x uh, mu at the top here right so if I've got the uh, covariant form of the four vector I can construct the contravariant form this way it's just a bookkeeping notation to keep track of when you have managed to insert the uh, metric in there so when I write uh, things this way so x mu times x mu this is of course meaning that what I've got is I've got x mu times now in this case g mu mu times x mu and that is going to make all the space-like terms have negative uh, values in front of them so this gives us something uh, as I mentioned before that is invariant it doesn't change when you transform from one inertial frame to another inertial frame so if you take a covariant four vector and multiply it by the contravariant form of the four vector you end up with something that is invariant and that always applies regardless of which four vectors um, 
you're using here, right? Obviously, these four vectors have to transform under Lorentz transformation, um, but any quantity that you've got there that will transform under Lorentz transformation when you take the co and contravariance, so in other words, you make sure you insert this metric in the middle, you will end up with a Lorentz invariant quantity. And if you're not convinced by me telling you, then it's not that hard to go through the algebra um, and put in a Lorentz boost and see that this will actually be equal to x prime mu oops, uh, times x prime mu, right? So again, covariant times contravariant because we need to make sure that this metric is uh, inserted in the middle. Now, because these, you know, essentially this is the magnitude, if you like, of a four vector, um, because this is invariant, it means we can actually use this to classify four vectors. And so we can say that if x um, mu x mu is less than zero, then clearly in this case the space-like parts are dominating because you ended up with a negative magnitude, and so we say that this is space-like. Right? And if we have x mu, x mu being greater than zero, then clearly the time component is dominating. And so we say that this is uh, time-like. And if we have it actually equal to zero, then, of course, at that point, you will have something, if you're looking at positions, that's moving at the speed of light. And so we say that this is light-like. And you may be familiar for, with these classifications because in when you first did relativity, you may have talked about something called interval, which is in fact just x mu x mu. Right? That's all the interview is, interval is, is it's the magnitude of the four position vector. Now remember, of course, this is just like a space vector. You could use it to have coordinates, but you can also use it to represent um, you know, changes in time, changes in position between two different events. In fact, if you think about it, coordinates really are a change in position and change in time, because all they are is the change in position and change in time relative to the origin where everything is zero. So you know, this interval uh, that you've probably encountered before is just the magnitude of the four position vector, and you can classify it into these four types. But you can do this in general for any four vector. So we've now seen how we can construct a four position vector using our time and space coordinates, how we can transform that with a four by four matrix, and how we have these useful sort of bookkeeping concepts of covariant and contravariant that tell us when we need to put in the space-time metric, the matrix that sort of essentially contains the structure of our space-time, which in this case, because we're doing special relativity, is flat. So now we've got those tools, we want to move on because in particle physics we need to look at particles that decay or particles that collide, and to do that we need to look at dynamics. And that's what we'll discuss, relativistic dynamics, in the next video.